Chapter 21 At last you have arrived and my becoming is complete. Was I expected then? You were invited. You have become the part that I was lacking, the part that I cannot control. Without you it was becoming a little too boring in here. What are you? What do you want me to be? I'm whatever you want to make of me. Everything you have always wanted to be. And you've been waiting for me forever. Not you as you were, but you as you have become. Yes, I've been waiting for that forever. But someone else was responsible for that. No matter. She was the catalyst, but the questions and the emotions were always within you. Now do you, we, accept and embrace with understanding our apotheosis? Do I have a choice? Of course. We all have a choice, even me. So what's in it for me? All that was, is and could be, we would experience together. And beyond that, we choose not to go. I see I can't avoid it, but will it be fun? It's what you make of it. But it could be an awfully big adventure, Raphael. In a shower of splinters of plastic and fire, the Doctor and Fetch burst into the chambers of the Grand Matriarch. As the pressure destabilised, they dived to the floor. Long seconds passed before Kandasi reacted and rearranged its structure to seal the window. As the pressure stabilised and oxygen was pumped back into the room, the Doctor helped Fetch to his feet. Fetch took off his helmet and began to unzip his spacesuit. The Doctor stopped him. There's no time for that, he said impatiently. Where's the way to the preparation room? This way, Doctor, he said, and opened a door leading to a private lift. The grand matriarch's fingers lighted gently, reverentially, on the helmet which awaited its final victim. Once placed on Ace's head, it would sap away her aggressive tendencies and transfer them directly into the heart of the god machine. Like a holy man carrying a sacred relic, she glided stately over to the defenceless ace. She stiffened when the door to the elevator whooshed open. As the doctor and Fetch raced into the room, she bared her teeth in a grimace of hate, like a snake confronting its prey. Matriarch, don't! screamed the doctor. Doctor! she hissed the word. After all this time we meet again! The doctor stopped suddenly shocked beyond measure at the sight of the little smiling girl he had once known, now changed into a twisted, perverted, lusting harpy. And he hung his head, recognising the role he had played in her transformation. If only he hadn't been so supremely confident of his abilities all those years ago. Matriarch, I beg of you. You don't understand what you're doing, he pleaded. There's still time to exercise the evil which has possessed you. The matriarch snarled in reply. Then take me instead, he offered. Only spare Ace's life. No, Professor, cried Ace. The matriarch ignored her outburst. Do you take me for a simpleton, Doctor? A mind as dark and devious as yours, absorbed into my machine? That would not serve my purposes. Matriarch, Lilith, please. The grand matriarch flung her head back and laughed triumphantly. Then you leave me no alternative, said the doctor grimly, and raised the blaster, directing it at the matriarch. The man of peace at last resorts to violence, chuckled the grand matriarch. Her green eyes blazed and the gun vanished from the doctor's hands. I already have great powers, Time Lord. Soon my abilities will be without bound. Now kneel, kneel and pay me homage. The Doctor grimaced as he fought the huge mental powers of the Grand Matriarch, augmented by her union with the Time Worm. Slowly, inexorably, he found himself being pushed to his knees by the sheer force of her possessed will. Ace looked on in horror. Mistress, said Fetch, I don't understand. Please let me help you. The Matriarch looked warily at the companion who had served her faithfully and without question for fifty years. You again? If you only knew how you bored me with your snivelling and crawling, you are no better than the irradiated cells you and your kind were first created from. Mistress? There was a wealth of emotion in that one word. The matriarch's eyes flashed once more, and Fetch stiffened and fell down dead. You callous bitch, cried Ace. He loved you. Always so aggressive, Dorothy, said the matriarch, and Ace growled in anger at hearing her hated real name. It's time to put that aggression to good use. 
Still on his knees, the Doctor watched in horror as the Grand Matriarch, she who was once Lilith and was now possessed by the Time Worm, raised the crown high above Ace's head. Now let all of time be mine to feast upon, exalted the Matriarch, and brought the crown down. Suddenly, the doors burst open, and a bitterly cold wind swept through the room. The metal walls buckled and collapsed, crashing down on the prone body of Fetch. The matriarch screamed in horror as the helmet crashed to the ground, smashing into a thousand glittering pieces. Her mental control broken, the doctor sprang to his feet and rushed over to the dazed ace, helping her off the couch. Beyond the preparation room, in the rest of Kandasi, machines exploded or burst into flame. The Pangistri and the companions ran in blind terror as the floor shook and then exploded beneath their feet. In some parts of the space station, metal walls turned to molten metal within minutes. In other parts, the air itself froze solid. Objects which were not bolted to the floor began to rise of their own accord and smash helplessly into each other. Viewports smashed outwards, exposing whole sections of the space station to the airless and sub-zero temperatures of the vacuum. Throughout the ship, alarms blared and emergency units went into action, trying in vain to limit the damage. Kandasi trembled and shook in its orbit. Professor! What's happening? The Grand Matriarch! Follow her! White with terror, the Grand Matriarch had hitched up her skirts and with her newfound vigour was running desperately down to the centre of Kandasi. Dodging falling structures, the Doctor and Ace followed her. The ground cracked and rocked sickeningly beneath their feet. As they ran, things started to stabilise and quieten down, as though whatever power had been unleashed was now learning how to control and regulate itself. By the time they had reached the Matriarch on the balcony overlooking the God Machine... Only a distant rumbling suggested that anything was amiss. The matriarch spun round when they approached her. Silhouetted in the golden glow, she seemed like a demon bathing in the flames of hell. Professor, what's happened? asked Ace breathlessly. The god machine's out of her control now, he said softly, and put an arm around Ace's shoulder. Ace felt her body tense. Raphael? He's learning to take control of it become part of it. Five thousand years of waiting, wailed the matriarch, to be thwarted at the moment of success. The doctor looked at the figure of the grand matriarch of the Pangistry with genuine compassion. Convulsions racked her entire body, and the doctor and Ace watched in horror as a hideous form began to disassociate itself from its reluctant host. The Time Worm, translucent and glowing with hatred, stood staring at the Doctor. Little remained now of the goddess it had once been. Its body was metallic and serpentine, its face a contorted mask of loathing. It took a step forward. The whole chamber was suddenly bathed in a brilliant light, and the Doctor and Ace instinctively covered their eyes. The only sounds to be heard were the blood-curdling wails and sub-animal screeches of the Time Worm in its final unremitting agonies. When the light dimmed and they could see again, only the Grand Matriarch remained on the gallery. The Time Worm had vanished, removed by that part of what had been Raphael, which now controlled the God Machine. For a second, deprived of the power of the Time Worm, the Grand Matriarch appeared her true age, a withered crone, thousands of years past her time of dying. Her headdress fell off, reeling a bald, mottled skull. The fire in her eyes had died, and they darted blindly about. Her brittle bones, unable to support her weight, snapped under her, and she slumped to the floor. She tried to drag herself forward on withered, broken arms towards the doctor, who turned his face away in shameful revulsion. Her cracked lips opened, but the only sound that came out of them was a dry, plaintive squeak. And then she was suffused in a blissful orange light. The Doctor and Ace looked on in wonder at the pathetic old hag before them. Time seemed to be folding back on itself. The flesh, taut over her cheekbones, became fresh and supple once more. Hair began to grow rapidly on her skull, at first white, then grey, and then a wonderful flaming red. Further back in time she regressed until she was a child again, a beautiful, innocent, red-haired girl. She smiled, her first smile in over five thousand years, and looked at the doctor. 
I like you, sir. You're nice. The doctor shuddered. It was as a child, cleansed of all guilt and her burden at long last lifted, that the grand matriarch died. An hour later, Ace stared accusingly at the doctor. There were unshed tears in her eyes. You knew, didn't you? You knew all along. The doctor didn't answer. He laid a hand on Ace's shoulder. She pushed him away. Leave me alone, she snapped. It's because of you that Raphael's dead. Ace, there was no other way. Please believe me, he begged. It was Raphael's own decision. If I could have saved his life, I would have done. But it was either him or the end of everything. I could have gone. No, 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 he said empathetically. You're too aggressive, too full of grudges and frustrations. It was exactly what the time worm wanted. She turned her face away. You could have gone, she said in a monotone. You don't understand, Ace, he said tearfully. Once it possessed my mind, the time worm would have used me just as it did before. I'm no innocent, Ace. No, you're not, are you? Ace bit her lip. Why don't you trust us? Why do you watch us suffer and manipulate us like some... Why do you do it when you know all along what's going to happen? The doctor shook his head. We all of us have free choice, Ace. And Raphael made his... He forced her to look at him. What Raphael did wasn't to save the universe or even to defeat the Time Worm. He sacrificed himself for you, for that rebel from Perivale with all her faults and imperfections who was always out to prove herself. He loved you so much that he gave his life for you. And that's something that will always be with you. Ace attempted a smile. He said he needed me. It's nice to be needed. It is, he agreed. But Ace wasn't too sure whether he meant it. Aaron interrupted him. Doctor, Ace, the transporter room has switched itself on. The doctor chuckled. I rather think we're being told to go home, he said. Are Rep 2 and the Pangeus 3 waiting there? Aaron nodded. Well then, my friend, lead the way. The doctor took Ace's arm. He looked around at the devastation of Kandasi, thought of the lives that had been lost both here and on Kirith. If only there had been another way. There was a sad, knowing gleam in his eyes. In the mythology of your planet, Ace, Raphael was one of the angels of God. It's rather appropriate, I think. Sadly, they turned away and made their way back down to Kirith. <laughs>